without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our first keynote speaker. Many of you know her from um, really one of the most, I would call, seminal work in the field of Agile, uh, her book on retrospectives, Making Good Teams Great, that she co-wrote with um, Diana Larson. It's kind of the Bible retrospectives for most of us, um, giving us a framework for getting the most out of our retrospective exercises. She uh, has since been doing a lot of work with management coaching, leadership coaching, and coaching organizations toward making significant changes in working better. So she's going to talk to us today about making micro shifts and uh, experiencing macro results. Please join me in welcoming Esper Esther Derby. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. I was just thrilled to be invited back. So um, even though I grew up in a neighboring, the neighboring state of Pennsylvania, I did not spend much time in Ohio until I learned about this conference. And I, I think Columbus is sort of a hidden gem. And so I'm really happy to be back here. Yeah, let's give Columbus a hand. Yay. Um, so I, um, I started my career as a programmer. Do we have any other programmers in the room? People who were programmers at one point? Yeah. And then I did a bunch of other things. I did some testing, because we all used to do our own testing. You remember those days? Yeah. So any, any testers? OK, yeah, I was a team lead. Do we have anybody who's been a team lead or is a team lead? How about agile coaches? How about dev managers? Yeah, no dev managers? OK, we see a few. All right, so um, when I started as a programmer, I did not realize that my job was about change. But it really was. And there was a, a story that is very clearly etched in my brain about the first program I wrote which was automating the bid and estimating process for a light manufacturing firm. They manufactured that decorative tape that they put on automobiles. And we'd worked really hard, and we'd done a lot of testing, and we'd proved out the program, and the people who, who were in a position to say, yes, this is correct, had said, yes, it's correct. And we were really proud that we were going to be automating this process that had been you know, really manual and, and, and taken a long time. The night before the program was supposed to go live, I overheard a conversation between the chief estimator and the CEO of the company. The chief estimator didn't want to use the program. He wasn't saying it was incorrect. He wasn't saying it wasn't faster. He wasn't saying it was wrong. He just didn't want to do it because he loved his job. He loved you know, talking to the customers and talking to the guys on the floor and scratching out his figures and you know, having more conversations and then developing a relationship and, and then finally delivering this quote. And the program that we had worked so hard on, that I had worked so hard on, was changing his job. And that's when I realized that my job was about change. So whether or not you have change in your uh, job title, if you are writing programs that change the way people work, if you're um, an agile coach, if you're a dev manager who's looking at improving the way people do their work, then change is part of your job. And my guess is that most of you came here to this conference to learn something new that you could take back and help people do at your company. How many of you ha have a hope of lear learning something that you might apply? Yeah, a lot of you. So that's about change. So I, um, once, once I recognized that my job was about change, um, I started paying attention to how people respond to change and to what kind of changes I could accomplish working in the small. You know, so I observed things, 
and I would try things, you know, often very little things. Like one of the changes I made was, um, this was in my second programming job, uh, I put up a big chart of all the batch jobs. Anybody remember batch jobs? They still do batch jobs? Yes. I bet I could still get a job programming at some, at some insurance companies because they're probably still using code that, you know, anyway. Um, so I put up a big chart of all the batch jobs, and every time something blew up in the middle of the night, I stuck a push pin in it. And after a couple of weeks, we had data. Now, it may be that someone in the organization had this data, but it wasn't visible to us. It wasn't visible to the programmers. But here we had this chart, and it told us which programs were most likely to blow up, which led us to be more careful when we touch those programs, and also to start cleaning up the code, you know, to looking at what were the causes of these, um, these, pro these, these middle of the night blow ups, and what could we do to change it? What could we do to make it less likely? That was a change. And it was specifically a, a rather large change in a, in, a, in a group that valued the people who could come in in the middle of the night and fix things, right? Those were the heroes. Oh, you came in in the middle of the night and fixed something. Well, this was a change to looking at the code differently, but also looking at how can we prevent needing to come in in the middle of the night. So I just started paying attention to stuff like that. Um, and eventually, you know, I, I, I took a management job, which is actually not a promotion as much as a job and career change, right? And then I had some positional power. So I thought it would be easier to make changes. Oh, silly me. Um, there, are, there are great limits to positional power when you're trying to make a change. You can tell people you want them to do things differently, but that's seldom sufficient. And you may get surface compliance, but you may not get deep understanding. So I had to study change from another aspect and look not just at what I did, but what other people did in terms of trying to bring change to organizations. So now I want to tell you a story about a change in the organization I worked for, which I will euphemistically refer to as Bradley's. Um, the executives at Bradley's noticed that projects were often late and over budget. Not often, almost always. As a matter of fact, with only a couple of exceptions. Their, their, their projects were way late and way over budget. So I watched what they did, what the executives did, as they used their traditional levers of power to try to change. It was very educational. So in the first year, they decided that the reason that their projects were all late and over budget was because people were insufficiently motivated to get things done on time. After all, there were no consequences. There had been no firings. No one had been demoted. So clearly, the issue was that people did not have the commitment to get the projects in on time. It was purely a matter of their commitment and motivation. So they put in some incentives. And the incentive was that uh, there would be a bonus available if your project came in at plus or minus 5% of, of the original budget and schedule. Well, what do you think happened? Any guesses? Well, it looked really good for about the first two quarters. And then it started looking not so good. And then suddenly, they couldn't hide the problems anymore. And the projects were once again late and over budget. So the executives pondered the situation and looked at the emerging field of professionalized project management and decided that the reason these projects were not late was not that people lacked the commitment and the motivation. It was that they were not certified project managers. So 
they moved many people to the side and they brought in a whole new batch of cert certified project managers. They put emphasis on project management certification for anyone who had been in a project role. And what do you think happened? Any guesses? There was a proliferation of project plans and um, tasks about, uh, talk about front-loading front -loading tasks and linking tasks and critical path and all of this other great stuff. I once actually heard someone say, you should never put anything on the critical path because then everything that is linked to it will be late. <laughs> um, which, which is what comes when you understand project management by, by uh, reverse engineering the project management software. So once again, there were high hopes, and everything looked good. The project plans were being turned in on time, and there were nice dashboards that said, you know, my project is in green status. Everybody was in green status, until suddenly they were in red status. And then the question was, how could you ruin this project? Everything was going just fine until two weeks before it was due. Oh, so they tried something else. The third year of this, uh, pro this uh, change project, uh, they tried uh, a methodology that had prescribed uh, meetings with um, proposed meeting agendas that had uh, what they, they weren't called um, documents. They were called work products and job aids. And there were lists of things you had to do and particular things you had to fill out. And everything, after some grumbling, of course, looked good. You know, standardized process. They had a lot of training. Everybody was trained in the methodology. There was a support team that tracked the metrics and made sure that people were filling in the required work products and job aids and that the proper documents were produced at the right time. And at the end of the year, victory was declared. This is method is now business as usual. It's inculcated into our culture. And I looked around and I said, well, people are calling documents work products, and they're calling um, their various design things job aids, but everything else is pretty much the same. Things were still late, things were still over budget, but dang, those compliance metrics looked good. So what happened here? Something happened to my slide is what happened here. Okay. So in the first year, uh, they focused on individual will. You know, people just aren't motivated because they are not going to suffer consequences if they don't deliver. So that was the first year. In the second year, it was focused on individual skill. We have people who are not skilled project managers, and that must be the problem. In the third year, they focused on process standardization, which is in some ways a compensation for individual skill and individual will. And from some standpoint, you could say that's systemic thinking, right? Unfortunately, it was a very mechanistic view of systems um, that if we just provide the correct specifications for every part and every part does its job, all will be well. And we had old wine in new bottles. The pattern really hadn't changed. In spite of three years of interventions, nothing had really changed. Personal motivation wasn't the problem. Individual skills weren't the problem. Knowledge wasn't the problem. Stand lack of a standard methodology wasn't the problem. Unless you think I'm talking about an agile implementation, this started in the 90s, right? So this is not a new pattern. The, the dynamics of, the, of projects remain the same, and the dynamics of software development remain the same. So the common threads are they had one root cause. Every year they had a new root cause. 
They had very long feedback loops, right? They had no way to tell if their, uh, if their effort was headed in the wrong direction or not until the end of the year when they couldn't hide the problems anymore. They had no intermediate indicators. And they had a sort of temporal blindness, right? They had a sort of temporal blindness. They, um, they did not examine their historical data and realize that, you know, in all of our data over six years, only two projects have come in on time. So lateness is not a bug, it's a feature of these large projects. Now, I want to emphasize that these executives and managers and project managers involved in this slow-moving, non-change change were smart, they were educated, they were capable, they had good intentions. These were not stupid people. These were, these were people who had all the smarts, but they weren't necessarily thinking about change in, in a way that supported actually changing the underlying pattern. The management system focused on individuals, individual job descriptions, individual um, performance reviews, individual recognition. Um, so they weren't really supported to think about their, their underlying system in any sort of way that enabled them to address all of the factors that were contributing. The thing is that people are easy to see. It's easy to see the people who might be delivering something late. It's easy to see the people who you assume don't have the, the motivation to do something. People are easy to see. We can observe people's behavior. So it's easy for us to focus on that. But it's hard to see systems. How do you see a system? We see the effects of a system. We see what happens as the result of the system. But we, it's hard to see the system. And most of our images of systems come with a sort of legacy of mechanistic thinking. So our image as, is that um, our systems are going to be like machines, and if every part does its part, all will be well, right? Well, human organizations are not well-oiled machines. They are far, far from it. So when you focus on, a, on the people, and the issue is really a systems problem, it's going to prolong the issue and it may actually make matters worse. You know, as happened at Bradley's, the company I used to work for, they made these big changes that were focused on improving individual skill and will. It caused a lot of disruption. It caused a lot of, of, of ill feelings. It cost a lot of money and in the end, it didn't really change much. But there is another way to think about change that focuses on seeing the system and looking at the factors that are causing the effects that we see. So instead of focusing on the observed behavior of people, we look at it as their behavior is to a large extent being driven by the system. What can we figure out that's driving that behavior? And that's where we come to micro shifts. Now, big changes tend to feel like an existential threat. When someone comes in and says, we are changing the entire way you do your job, your job may not exist anymore, um, you have to relearn all these things, most people feel that as some sort of loss. Some, they may feel confusion, they may feel that their identity is at stake. And frankly, it just freaks people out. It freaks people out. And when things go wrong, you've got a big mess. You have a big old mess. But micro shifts, sometimes I say experiments, sometimes I call them nudges, uh, take account of where the system is and move it in a better direction a little bit at a time. Just a little bit at a time. 
And they take account of where you are because change, contrary to what we often think, doesn't start with a vision. It starts right here. It starts with where you are. So some truths about systems. Systems determine the overall pattern of results. They influence individual performance to a very great degree, and they do what they do. Systems don't jump. Now, systems do collapse if they are put under sufficient stress. And sometimes that, uh, when it does look like a system has, has made a dramatic change, it is actually the result of a thousand little small changes. If you've ever piled sand and sand and sand on top of sand, it gets to a point where it falls back down, right? It looks sudden, but it's actually the result of many, many grains of sand coming together. So if we want a system to do something else, we need to understand what is contributing to the way it's behaving now, and we need to look at shifting that. Adding an, a process on top of what already is will give you unpredictable results and is not likely to change the pattern. This is sounding familiar to anybody. Has anyone experienced this? Yeah, where they come in with a new process and it's pretty much the same as the old, yeah. So what we do in microshifts is we try something, we see what people need to learn, and we try something else. Now, our image um, of, of, of organizations as machines is unconsciously held, right? But it is there. All of us have heard phrases like, you know, we want to be like a well-oiled machine. We've all heard phrases like that, and it has influenced the way our organizations are designed, it influences the way we think about them. Um, but in a machine, all the connections and interactions are finite and predictable. You can take apart a car and put it back together and it will function in the same way if you know what you're doing. It wouldn't work if I tried it, but it would work if some people tried it. So the connections and interactions are finite, they're designed, and they're knowable. But that's really not what our organizations are like. Our organizations are more like this. They're more like a forest, where the connections and interactions are virtually infinite. They're not all knowable. We can't always predict what will happen when we make a change. We can't take it apart and put it back together. Things affect each other in ways that we may not understand until we look at them in retrospect. How many of you have heard about the Yellowstone Wolf Project? Anybody heard about that? Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. If you haven't looked at it, it's worth looking up because what they did was they, they in 1995, they reintroduced the um, top predator into Yellowstone, and it affected the beaver colonies, it affected erosion in streams, it affected the, the plants that were available, right? So this one change had a cascading effect through it all. And this is, this is what, what complex adaptive systems are like, right? One seemingly small change can have very broad effects. They may be beneficial or they may not be, which is one of the reasons I like to do micro shifts because then if there's a mess, it's a small mess and chances are you can recover from it. So when you think about changing a system, you know, we can't think about installing new parts or rolling out a new process. I think it's more useful to think about forest secession. You can't start from rocky ground and plant a forest. It doesn't work. You may end up with something that looks like a plantation and that requires intensive effort to keep it going. But forests actually come to be through a process. You know, it may start with this rocky ground and then some shrubs move in 
And that provides a little bit of moisture that might enable another species that requires more moisture to move in. And the roots will change the soil. And the natural processes of photosynthesis and the plants taking in um, nutrients will change the soil. And then another species will be able to take hold. And it might be a species that grows taller and creates some shade, which creates more moisture, which allows another species to come in that requires more moisture. And then you start getting trees of a certain sort, trees that survive in relatively arid conditions. And eventually those trees again create another cycle of creating more moisture and changing the soil, allowing more plants to come in and you end up with a forest. You can't go from here to here. You have to find the steps, right? And each one of those steps enables something new to emerge. You can't plant a tree on the rocky ground and expect it to grow. You have to look at what are the steps what are the tiny little steps that are going to enable this next thing to emerge and take hold and flourish? So, looking back to Bradley's, if I got in my little time machine, and I was actually there so I can remember some of this, um, when I looked at what was going on that caused these late projects, there were a ton of influencing factors. There were a ton of them. This is a subset of them. Many, many things that were influencing what was happening in that organization. It was just simply the dynamics of software development. It was the long feedback loops. It was linear thinking about project management. If we just link all of these tasks together properly and we estimate them properly, then everything will work. It was the budgeting process. It was coordination overhead, communication. It was punishing bad news. It was focusing on individual tasks. It was overlooking capacity data. It was all of these things and dozens more. So what do you do in that sort of situation? You try to understand something about how things influence each other. So I just pulled out a handful of these and I thought about you know which affects the others. How are these entangled? Because we know in complex systems, there is seldom A to B linear causation. Things like forests are entangled, right? We don't know exactly. So I you know, get, kind of a, get kind of a gut feel for how these things are interacting, how they affect each other. I'm not worried about being precisely correct. I'm, I'm worried about having a rationale, some rational thought process for whatever I'm going to do to nudge things forward based on where the system is now and what it can do. Because systems only do what they can do until we teach them something else. I like to do this um, with making fine little nudges. Now, fine stands for fast feedback, inexpensive, no permission needed and easy. So this is how I was making changes when I was a programmer, right? I would find something I could do that would give me fast feedback that I didn't need to get approval, that I could just try, and it was pretty easy. And I changed a lot of things doing that. And you can change a lot of things in bigger organizations using this same principle. You find something, something small, a little nudge you can make, make it fine, and choose something that's likely to have a broad impact. So when I consider the situation at Bradley's, there are two examples that, you know, where I might have started, where I might have started. And actually, I did start on the historical one, um, looking at historical data. So how do you do a nudge? Um, you think about what it might influence. So if I were to look at historical data, it might have changed people's ideas about firm targets. You know, if they had looked at it and said, oh my God, we've got 100 projects here and only two of them have come in on time. 
maybe there's something about these projects. Maybe it's not the people. So it might have changed expectations. It might have led to more transparent status reporting. It might have influenced how people feel, hear bad news. Right? So there's, it might have had a broad effect on the system. But you have to think about what support is needed. So in this case, we'd need access to the data. We'd need to do a bit of sleuthing. And we'd need some basic data analysis skills right, to look at this data and make some sense of it. Now, it, it happened that Bradley's was in love with pie charts. So everything was done in a pie chart. So they, they always had snapshots. They never had a temporal view. That was part of what got into, the, into there. So that told me, well, if we want to make any difference with this, we need, to, we need to help people understand how to actually deal with data. And then you need to think about what would we see? We talk a lot about outcome measures. But when you're doing a change, that, those, are too, those are too long for feedback loops. You have to think about what could we observe in the near term that would help us know if this is making a difference. So what might we see? We might notice that people are talking about ranges instead of point estimates when we're in meetings. That's observable. It's detectable. Um, and it gives you some sense of whether the change is actually taking place. You might notice that there's less best case planning. You might. You might do more iterative planning. You might hear those things. Does this make sense? So you think about the nudge. You think about what support you need. You think about, um, you think about what people need to learn. And then you think about how would we notice. So if we had looked at a welcoming bad news, that might also have a fairly broad influence about transparency and status reporting, so that if people knew about issues, they could deal with them earlier before they were huge and their options had all dried up. Uh, they might do more adaptive planning. There might be more consideration for capacity. There would be less burden shifting and more feedback loops. But in order to do that, we'd need to have some modeling by someone influential. Um, we might need to give people a little structure for this is how you report bad news. This is how you receive bad news. So people aren't asking for excessive proof, or they're not, you know, they're not getting mad. They're asking a certain number of questions that will elicit more information without blame. And you might have some stories about you know, I learned, I learned about this issue, and it was really upsetting, and I, you know, I'm really worried. But then I got down to work, and I figured out this is how we need to adjust our expectations, and we need to really focus on a certain set of priorities, and we can, we can do something valuable. right? So you need to have some support. And again, you need to think about what might you observe. The small things you might observe, not a big measurement program with a capital M. Not with metrics, just what could we observe? How could we detect that this change is moving in a desirable direction? So I choose these based on what seems to have the potential for broad influence that isn't going to require an act of God or the approval of some large number of vice presidents. You want things that people can start with a handful of people, maybe by themselves, oops, maybe just working with a couple of other people, so that you can start moving changes forward. Because there's no perfect place to start, right? So you start where you can. It doesn't mean that you have to have executive influence to start. You can get a lot done on the team level if you just try some stuff. And then eventually you need to have you need to have support, right? You need to have support if you want to change some of the major systems like policies, like how people are rewarded. You know, if you want to change the, you know, the overall conception of what is tolerated in the organization. But you can get a lot done from where you are. You start fine. 
give things a little nudge, understand the system, where it's coming from, get some sense of what we might, how we might support a change, you know? I accomplished a lot, putting a, putting a big old picture of the bat stream up on the wall and putting push pins in it. Think about how you would observe a change. So as I said, I don't, um, I don't look for this to be precise. I look for it to be informative so that I understand how the system is currently work and I have some model of how it works. And, and by making these nudges, I'm testing my conception of how the system works and I'm learning more about how it works. Now, in this particular case, um, it would be easy to say, oh, we should change to more adaptive planning. We should get rid of deterministic planning. Um, but I, you know, that was too big a leap. That was just too big a leap in this particular organization. People weren't ready to believe that that was possible. They were still of a mindset that if we just have all the requirements and we estimate all the tasks and we link them all together, all will be well. So there were some precursors to that understanding, right? There were some precursors that might come up if we started looking at historical data, that might come up if we were more transparent, um, that would help people move to the place where that was actually something that people deeply understood. And I think this is where we go wrong in a lot of our agile transformations is that we assume that uh, people will ch start thinking differently as if they're turning on a light switch, right? And that, that's not how it works, right? People have to learn some things, people have to unlearn other things in order for a new way of thinking to take hold. It's forest succession again. You know, we're creating the conditions for a different way of thinking to happen, for a different behavior to be the default behavior. Now, I probably wouldn't have started with the budgeting process because that would have taken an act of God and more vice presidents that I could count. And people weren't ready to look at that. Right? They weren't ready to think about that differently. Best case planning, maybe, but there was really a strong belief that work expands to fill the time allocated. So if you, you, know, if you, if you give people the idea that it's going to be four to eight weeks, they will just dilly-dally around for the whole eight weeks. That was a really entrenched belief. You know, it was the belief that if we aren't pushing people, they won't, they won't work hard and we won't get things done. So those were not necessarily great places to start. People needed to go through a process to learn more about that. So when you're considering um, working on a micro shift, have a fine nudge and have a rationale based on what your system currently does. Systems do what they do. If we need to change it, it's not, uh, it's not a light switch. It's a, an accretion of small changes over time. Think about what people need in terms of support. What do you need to make this nudge? Do people need some basic data analysis skills that you can share with them informally, that you can start showing a different set of charts and explain what they mean? What do people need to learn? And what might you see? And then use the two step, two step rule of thumb. So the two step rule of thumb says that if your current, um, if your current uh, change initiative, you don't expect to see results in months, go two steps down. What can you do? What little change can you make that you might see something in weeks or days? Or in the case of Bradley's, if, you're, if your feedback loop is a year long, can you get it to, to weeks? What could you see in weeks? What can you do? This gives you a much better ability to steer whatever change you're working on. One might even say it's more agile. 
right? Small things, steer, adjust, look at what you're doing, make some changes, move from there. Watch what happens, create conditions, remember that you're working on a forest. Now this may sound like a very slow way to change an organization. I get that. I get that. On the other hand, Bradley's tried for four years and still had the same thing. So it's sort of a matter of how you're going to spend that time, right? It may sound like this isn't very efficient. Well, it may not be, but we're not talking about a machine. We're talking about effective. You know, and I, I really get that people want things to be fast and they want them to be efficient. They want them to sound well planned. And our training presupposes us to that. You know, we've all been trained in that for a long time. Forests don't happen in the, in the blink of an eye. They happen over time. And that is true of organizational too, change too. You can roll out training quickly. You can mandate a process. But you can't create learning and a robust and deep change without looking at what is holding the current pattern in place. What in our system, our environment, our policies, our structures, the way people are managed, what in those systems is holding the process in place? Is it because we are still individually rewarding people while we ask them for teamwork? Is it that we are still communicating to our clients that we, everything will be done on a particular date versus we're going to work on the highest priority stuff and learn about our capacity as we go? Is it something else? What is holding the pattern in place? So get out your detective hat. Get out your detective hat when you're thinking about uh, applying any of the changes that come to mind to you that when you hear an exciting new idea to, over the course of this conference. Get out your detective hat. What holds our current pattern in place? What might we change to make it more likely that this will take hold in our company? How can we think about this as a forest succession? How can we create the conditions? Because truly changing your organization is a matter of not implementing a new process, not training people, although those can both be helpful. Truly changing your organization is a matter of creating the conditions for something new to emerge. That's where you get profound change. And no matter where you sit, I don't care if you're the junior programmer or you're the CEO, you can nudge the system. You may not be able to change the entire system, but you may make your part work better. When your part is working better, someone will notice. And you can talk to them about what the changes you made were. And you can gain some allies. And you can start shifting another little part of the system. It may take longer than rolling something out. But the change itself probably won't actually take any longer. Because you'll be creating the conditions as you go. So even. If you don't have change management in your job description, your job involves change. And you can make profound change with small little nudges. I changed the way my, my fellow programmers thought about um, errors in the batch stream. And I changed the dynamic about people being rewarded for coming in with a big old chart and a bunch of push pins. There's a lot you can do from where you are. And you can start really, really small. So keep these questions in mind as you hear people's stories. You're going to hear some inspiring stories today and tomorrow. You're probably going to hear some new practices and some new ideas that you want to take home. 
to your company? So think about, with your detective hat on, what holds the current pattern in place? Why are people acting the way they do now? What needs to be in place for a new idea to flourish or a new practice to flourish? Do people need to think differently? What are the little skills that contribute to them? What are the things in our underlying system that we might need to shift a little bit? And what can you nudge from where you are now? What can you nudge? Fast feedback, inexpensive, no permission needed, easy from where you sit. So who's going, to, um, who's going to write me after this conference and tell me about what sort of nudges they put in place? OK. All right. Anybody else? OK. I will look forward to hearing from you about uh, how you nudge your system, how you make micro shifts that will eventually lead to macro changes. Now, um, do we have time for questions? Was that, was that a yes? yes? OK, so I will answer some questions or deflect them if need be. I can't see anyone from here because of the lights, you know. I cannot see a dang thing. No questions. Oh, I see a question. Stand up. Speak loud. There you go. Uh, so the question was, what do you do if the company wants everything to change at once? Um, I would pick something that I feel like I could have some influence over and try to look at what's, you know, what are they trying to accomplish and what's holding the current thing in place and what can I do to move, to move those things forward. I mean, changing everything at once is hugely disruptive. Um, and it, I think, underestimates the learning curve, the multiple learning curves that have to take place. So I, I have this. I have this idea that um, people, people conceive of change as, you know, we're going along like this, and we put in some big, massive, we're going to change everything, and performance will just, it's like a hockey stick. And it's actually more like this, where, you know, you get a lot of chaos and disruption, and people saying, oh, I don't know, I don't know what to do, I don't know who I'm supposed to talk to, I don't know where I'm supposed to look that up. And, and they don't have a chance to practice, learn new skills, integrate, climb that learning curve, figure out how to make things work in a new way, and then, and then you know, reach some point where they feel competent at it. Um, and changing everything at once can, can make that sort of chaos last a, a, a much longer time. So I would, I would try to find someone, one little thing that I can try to nurture the environment for and support people. Did that help? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting because I see a lot of um, companies uh, keep, their, keep their organization in sort of a perpetual state of chaos because they'll try some big change and that doesn't work, so then they try another big change and, oh, that doesn't work, oh, we better try something else, and they try another one, and so they just keep kind of bouncing around in this chaos phase for a, a prolonged period of time. Doesn't have to be that way. Are there other questions? Oh, hold on. And then you. Esther. Yes. With great respect for your work. Pardon? With great respect for your work, how do you ignite a retrospective in an organization where we're not used to looking at the bad news or our approach? I, 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 Retrospectives. Yes, what about them? How do you ignite them? What's your favorite oh. way to ignite them when people are not used to looking at uh, how to get better? Um. I start with something small that people can feel like they have some control over and something they care about, right? So if there's some problem they care about, 
then they're more likely to want to work on it. The trick was that, with that is that very often um, people feel like all the problems are outside the team, which may, to a certain extent, be accurate, right? So it's finding something that they can take some ownership for in their own, um, you know, their own sphere where they have control over it. Um, so, so you know, I wrote I wrote this book, right? And it has um, it has a bunch of exercises in it, which. The purpose of those exercises is to get people out of habitual thinking and to equalize participation. However, I, I, I get a sense that um, in many retrospectives, the exercises have become um, the point rather than something that supports people thinking and learning together. So lately, I have been um, putting more emphasis on let's look at data. Right, so we think we have a particular issue we need to deal with. What data would actually help us understand that? And how can we analyze the data? Um, you know, kind of as a countermeasure to, oh, let's just do fun retrospectives, right? No, let's do retrospectives that actually dig into the problem and help people feel like they can actually make a change to make their lives better. So, did that help? Okay. Uh, yes. Hey there, Esther. Um, so our organization, I think, does a pretty good job at times trying to use the lean idea of weighted shortest job first, you know, value compared to cost. You mentioned, though, that, you know, cost estimates or just any estimates can be conflated with commitments. What ideas do you have about nudges that we ought to be trying to make or what should we do to change conditions so that something else can emerge and flourish other than, you know, estimates becoming commitments? So um, how can we shift from est estimate thinking to con conflating estimates and commitments? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, the first thing I often try is I start uh, talking in, in ranges rather than um, point estimates, although there, there's a risk there that people are going to latch on to the low end of the estimate, you know, the low end of the range rather than the high end. So I talk about ranges. Um, I talk about uh, uh, a distinction between a bid and an estimate. You know, like you can get a bid on having your car fixed, right? Right, and they have tons of data to tell them that what it's going to be, but an estimate is um, not that. Right, it's 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 a it's a, a forecast based on some level of information. So I might actually change the language and s stop saying estimates. We forecast, we forecast that it's going to be this, right? Because people react differently to that word, right? Yeah. So, and, and think about what else holds that in place. I mean, it could be that people are punished if they don't meet, you know, their, the big estimate, you know? So then you look at, you know, how that works. So I'd look at all the things that, that fit in with it. Other questions? So yes. the situation I'm in, um, if you're trying to make a change in, in a department, you have a certain amount of pull, you're part of that department. What if you are in a department that's very friendly and adaptable to change, but there are other departments around it that are not so friendly, but you don't have so much pull because you're not part of them? Do you have any particular advice for that situation? Um, so the, the question, I, as nearly as I could hear it, these microphones actually are you know, not so easy to hear, um, was you know, if you, your, your, your own area is willing to, to make changes, but this other um, department isn't so willing, right? I would, I would try to see how the world looks from their point of view. I would try to build some relationships and, and see how things look. I mean, sometimes even starting to build some relationship can help, right? See it from their point of view, understand what might be going on in their system. Um, talk to them in terms that have meaning to them. So long, the, the long, um, another change I worked on was um, 
the, the handover process between development and production was just broken. It just wasn't working. And it had been outsourced, and so there weren't a lot of relationships. And I wanted to build some communication between those two groups. So I, I just facilitated that. I mean, I went and personally talked to people. I would ask them to come to this meeting. I'd say what I thought might, might be beneficial to them. But to get it approved to become a, a more formal thing, we need to, needed to have um, approval from a vice president. It was only one. This It wasn't an act of God and not a large number. It was only one. But I had to talk about it in terms that she cared about. Um, she did not care about uh, quality in an abstract way. She cared about how many outage minutes and how many customers are affected by those outage minutes. So I had to build the case really around what she cared about. And I think that goes a long way working with another department too. What do they care about? And how might this change benefit what is meaningful to them? Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. I think if I go any longer, I'm into your break. And that would not be good, would it? OK. So one more thing. Um, the material in, in th that I talked about today is part of uh, uh, this book that I wrote that is at the printer this month. Um, but it is available for pre-order um, on Amazon, and there's some information about it on your table. Um, it's now available as an e-book, too. How exciting. Um, and I write an occasional newsletter, so if you'd like to sign up for that, this, this code should get you to that, to sign up. So I will be here um, for the rest of the conference. And if you guys, you know, I'd love to talk to you about the changes you're trying in your organization or any other topic you want to talk about. And talk about how we can make change work a little better, how we can nudge things towards a better situation. Micro shifts. OK, thank you. Thank you.